Well, thank you very much, the Fry Museum and Mary Jane, for inviting me to speak here. I rarely leave the Shire. It's one of my uh, mottos in life. Don't leave the Shire. You don't know what's going on out there in the world. But I, I love the mission of the Fry and the idea of the conference, and so I thought this would be a worthwhile moment to cross the big water and uh, come over here and, and speak and see the city. So thank you. Um, so the, the subject I decided to talk on is what, what do we mean when we say aging? And the first thing I want to say is nothing I say in this lecture should mitigate the uh, pure bitch that is mortality, <laughs> right? It really, it really is a, a design flaw in the universe. You may have noticed this. <clears throat> we age, which is one thing, but we die. More importantly, we don't care if we die. We're, we're sort of neutralish on this, I've decided, when we don't really want to die. But people we love and care for die. This is not good, this is not fun. But it is the nature of being human, of being alive, of being mortal. And so when I speak of aging, this is really not a question of mortality, because that is a given. Um, to me, when you say aging, and what do we mean when we say aging, really what we mean, uh, if we think about it, is not dead yet. <laughs> right? And from the moment you're born, if you're mortal, what you are is not dead yet. And so the question that I really wanted to ponder was, how do we culturally, individually, but mostly culturally address the central problem of our society, of, of the, not society, of mortality, which is, what do we do and how do we conceptualize not being dead? Um, the word we tend to use is aging. In theory, this is neutral. In practice, what we mean is aging is bad. Now this is silly because again, from the moment you're born, you're aging. Everything that is alive is aging. What it, what it means besides not dead yet is undergoing change, undergoing transformation. So think about, we, we, we tend to think of aging almost invariably as something that happens at the end of your life, which is of course silly because we don't know when our lives are going to end, number one. Uh, and number two, of, again, we've been aging since we were born. So imagine the changes that you underwent from the time you were five, from the time you were 15. You tripled in size, or more, right? We acquired incredible uh, uh, imaginative, critical powers of thought. Our vocabularies, our educations, our experiences of the world were manifoldly increased. It was a, a, a titanic, tremendous, uh, um, I think if we had to do it consciously, terrifying change. And yet little kids seem to pull it off okay, <laughs> right? It doesn't seem to bother them so much. Uh, and so what this is, this is a little tip it should let you know that a lot of what we mean by aging and how we respond to it is a lot psychological. It has nothing to do with what is actually going on. Because certainly, without doubt, the most tremendous change we will ever undergo, besides probably dying, which we don't experience at the end, uh, is... Is, is just growing that age when we're conscious, say when we really sort of start being aware of the world around five or six or seven, uh, to the time that we start getting sort of more mature, say 15, 16, 17, 18, our entire, I mean, all biologically, biochemically, just, I, to me it's just the fact that we get huge. Every time I see a little kid, I think that's not right. We could not have ever have been that small. You may have, you may have had this experience if you ever went back to, the, to where you went to elementary school. And you go in your kindergarten class, you're like, when did they shrink all the furniture? <laughs> Why is it so tiny? Because it was my size when I, oh, wait a second, perhaps this is the size it was. See how strange that is? Our, 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 our relationship to change, um, I think, is what we mean when we say aging. And so one of the mistakes we make is, of course, is thinking this has something to do with the end of your life. It does not. We will continuously age, which is to say change, until we die. Um, and so what I'm curious about is the stories that we tell ourselves. This is Simone de Beauvoir, by the way, the great French uh, thinker and philosopher. She talked about the importance of the stories that, and the narratives that we tell ourselves. So from psychological research, what we know is that the now that we experience is about mm, three to seven seconds long. When we say now, psychophysiologically, what we're really talking about is a period of time that's at about three, a little lower, less than that, to maybe seven seconds, maybe a little longer under some circumstances. But it's a very brief period. So, so that if I jab you with something sharp, this is the kind of thing psychologists like to do to people. Uh, if, if, we, if we jab you with something sharp, 
right? You'll experience that pain, but it will fade quickly, but particularly if I jab you with something else sharp. Even if the new poke is less intense than the previous poke, because it is falling within that psychological attention span, it tends to displace the earlier effect. Uh, and so we move in this sort of very brief moment of now through our whole lives. And so when we talk about something like aging, what we're really thinking about is the kind of cultural narratives, the memories that we call up from the past and how we imagine them as we move into the future. And we're in this continuous narrative. Those one of the wonderful things about human beings is we live almost entirely in our imaginations, right? The, the, this, I think this is why the world of art has power, is because we don't live here. We live in this imaginary world that we like to see reflected back to us in these incredible works of visual or musical or dance or uh, poetry or literature, whatever it is, because this is really where we live. We live to a limited degree in the, in the physical here and now and to a huge degree in, in the, a combination of our memories that are, of course, selective. Not that we would ever edit our memories, but no, we, we select our memories very carefully to support our model of ourselves and, and how we imagine we're carrying those memories, our concept of ourselves, into the future. Um, and so one of the things we've done in our culture, bizarrely, I would say, um, is, is we've decided that when you reach some age, and I couldn't pick the exact age, so I'm just going to say 25. It might be slightly later, but it's certainly not after 30, and I'll, I'll give you a hint to why that is soon. Um, we decide, that's it. I'm mature. I'm an adult. And now everything should stop. And this version of myself will now travel forward through time for infinity. This is our narrative. This is our cultural narrative. So when people say jackass things like, uh, you know, 50 is the new 30, right? This is, this is, this is absurd. It really is. What, the, what they're saying is, oh, no, I've carried my 30-year-old self for 20 years. If you do that, you've, you, that's a psychological disease, right? You've, you've sort of frozen yourself in time and are having new experiences, new changes. I mean, what the hell is wrong with you? That's, that's crazy. You know, that, no, 50 is not the new 60, is the new 40. Who wants to be 40 in insipid age? Um, you know, so this, this, this kind of, of, uh, of struggle, right? So what we want to do is we want to freeze ourselves in time, which our culture tells us. Um, and then that we imagine that that person physically, intellectually, emotionally, travels forward, forever. And then at some point, when that totally bizarre narrative is unsustainable, we think, oh, something is wrong. I am not as sexually potent as I was when I was 16. I need a pill. Or perhaps you're just getting older. Right? I mean, it, no, no, we need a pill. Have, have some Viagra or what are the other ones I forget? Cialis, Cialis, right? Have some Cialis. Because sexual potency is what I had at a certain age when I was the right way. And if I lose that, I've become wrong. But notice if you wrote that the other way, it would be weird. Here, six-year-old kids, you're not sexually potent. Have some pills. <laughs> See, we don't do that. Oh, I hope we don't do that. Are we doing that? We might be. We're crazy with the pharmaceuticals, let's face it. But, but the idea is right that, that we want to sustain this completely imaginary version of ourselves. And so even if you, I like to watch, if you see like retirement commercials on TV or ads for them, there are always people with a little gray hair who are behaving as if they're 20. <laughs> Let us learn something in the intervening 50 years. We do not want to be 20 when we're 70. We don't want to be 20 when we're 30. We don't want to be 15 when we're 20. But at some point we lose that. Right? I think when we're younger, we go, oh, I want to be older. I want to get this. There's some magic age that I want to achieve when I can drink, when I can vote, uh, when I can drive, when I can get out of college. And, and then I want to stop. That that's the age. And now everything is sort of this downhill slide. And so we have this bizarre cultural narrative of, of age. That's okay. Don't think about that. Freeze. And then anything that varies from that freeze moment, whenever we decide that is, culturally, like I said, it's, it's, it's ridiculously young, uh, then it's deterioration. 
then we're trying to patch up in various ways. Uh, you know, you can do all kinds of uh, elective plastic surgery. By the way, elective surgery, a phrase I do not understand. Um, you know, you just, you just, uh, you, you know, we're, we're going to, to maintain this youthful look. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, you usually see this with, with uh, mothers and daughters who dress the same generally the way the daughter dresses, right? It's the sort of horrible clinging onto youth, a sort of psychological vampirism. Um, that, that we become infected with because of our culture. But it, this narrative, like I said, this is a story we tell ourselves. This does not have to be this way. A Kuwaiti friend of mine said when he was young uh, in Kuwait and Tunisia, he said, you wanted to be old because the old guys, they sat in the cafes all day, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffees, playing dominoes, talking about politics, and then at, when school was out, all the grandkids would come and visit them, and they read the newspaper. And, the and when you were a kid, you were like, man, someday. And they're in their white robes, right? And they're looking fabulous. And they're with their friends. And they're like, someday, I'm going to get to be old. right? I'm going to get to reach this stage of life where I can just put away all my troubles, put on the nice robe, and hang out in the coffee shop with my friends. Have the grandkids around. Right? That, that different stages of life are different. Can't, they, you, you neither should nor want to freeze. I just did a lecture on Confucius, and there are several passages in the Confucian canon where, he, where Confucius or people, Mencius, other writers working on this, talk about you know, what's appropriate for every age. When you're, when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50, when you're 60, when you're 70, when you're 80, when you're 90, when you're 100, the emperor has to pay you respect. Right? Your life has totally changed now. But the, the concept is, you know, you, you're going to change. And so what you want to do is, is change your way of life, change how you are, change how you imagine yourself. Not in a, in a, it's not wrong or bad, it's just different. And to the degree that we try not to accept difference is the degree to which we're struggling with the whole notion that we change, that we age. It's inevitable we're going to, but we don't like it very much. And of course, some aspects of aging, we read as less good. Oh, I'm not as strong as I was, right? I can't drink as much as I used to. H however, whatever the, the, the aspects of it that are. But notice part of this is, again, writing the standard of youth as the bar. And so one thing you'll see if you read the Confucian ethics, you'll see this in other cultures, is they spend a lot of time telling young people to get good habits. You are not always going to be this way. So what you want to acquire when you're young are habits that will help you through your whole life. But we say as you're young, just blow yourself up. That's fine. <laughs> and then at some point when you realize you can't just blow yourself up, well, life is over. Right? That, it, it's sort of this weird, like I said, it's this weird frozen narrative. And so, again, it, it, we can look at all kinds of different cultures that did not think of it this way. Um, the etymology, by the way, of the word aging, uh, it comes from the shared, well, they call it Proto-Indo-European root, uh, but it's a shared language that traces back to the Sanskrit, to the or, or tie into the Sanskrit and the European languages. Um, and it, aging comes from a word that used to just mean vitality. And this still lives in our language if you think of the word courage. Courage, core is just heart, of course. And then age means vitality. As courage is vitality of the heart. You, you, you have that vitality, that capacity, the, the drive. So what just meant a certain kind of vitality for life. It did not mean a particular time of life. It didn't mean a particular age. It didn't mean anything. It just, it just meant, again, basically to be alive. And old comes from the, you know, it's, this is going to come from the Anglo-Saxon roots. Uh, it just meant to be an adult. So old age was the vitality that came from not being a child. This is what the, and this is clearly how this used to be interpreted and what this meant. And then what you did with the vitality, with the life force, well, this is what mattered. How, how do you use the life force that you have? That is, of course, changing as you get older. Um, uh, Mary Jane asked me to recommend a work on, on aging, and so I thought about that, and I thought, ooh, Lear, King Lear. Very upbeat, hilarious play. Um, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so but I thought, I did, but I love Lear because, well, one, it's, the, it's Lear, what a wonderful play. But two, because what the problem, the central problem with Lear's play, who knew himself but slenderly, a great line about Lear, was that he wanted to stop living. He says to his daughters, I want to give it all away. I want to let go. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be Lear anymore. And one thing you can take from the play is that Shakespeare is saying, ah, no. No, you can't do that. It's not, you, you can, but nothing as good is going to happen. Nothing good is going to uh, occur when you try to just release all of your vitality. When you try not, he's King Lear. If he's not the king, he's not Lear in some amazingly important ways. And he, that's what he wants. He wants to let go of the troubles of the world. He doesn't want to struggle anymore. He doesn't want to be exhausted anymore. And his clown and Kent, and just about everybody in the play who's not trying to kill him or rob him, keep saying, you can't do that. There is no moment when you can stop living, because that is the moment when you begin to die. Uh, and I just read, by the way, along the same lines, uh, perhaps not quite as literary a, a subject, but uh, anybody read the Ian Fleming 007 novels? I've never, I've never actually read the James novels before, and I don't, James Bond novels, and I thought, well, why not read them, right? So I did. And in the second, I believe the second one, called Live and Let Die, um, I can't really recommend them that highly, I must say, but it does have this great passage <laughs> where Bond, who has been variously shot and tortured and threatened and, you know, his friends are getting killed and sort of bad things happen to you when you're an international spy, is, is going through a retirement community in Florida. And he looks around and he says, you know what, I think I would rather just call crawl in the tomb and pull the lid closed on top of me. <laughs> and I think there is this element, right, that to stop, to, to give up, really is the opposite of aging. Aging is to continue to have that thrive, to continue to change, to continue to evolve. Which is, let's face it, it's exhausting, it's tiring. Remember how exhausting it was when you were 15 and 16? Right? What the hell is going on? My body is changing. I got hormones whizzing around. I don't know what's going on. Right? It's very confusing. It's very disturbing. People always say, oh, teenagers, they're angry, they're upset, they're hard to deal with. Well, hell yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, the poor guy. I mean, just think about the problems that we face. We tend to forget this, right? We think, oh, it was a magical age. I was like, no, it was not a magical age. It's amazing that we survive it at all. I've always thought at some point, at, at some age, now-ish maybe, they should force us to go to like six months of intense hormone therapy just to remind us how horrible it was. <laughs> Where it's just, uh, everything is racing through your body, you don't know what the hell is going on, you're getting weird emotions, sexual desires, your, in, your intellectual capacity develops to an extraordinary degree over those years, by the way. Um, this is Simone de Beauvoir again talking about this, said when she went through menopause, she's like, oh, thank God. She says, I feel like I've taken control of my life. She says, before I felt like I was sort of in this continually argument with my emotions and my feelings. It would just go on these waves. And she says, when I went through menopause, I was like, oh, oh, I felt sort of more in command of who I was, of my body, how I felt, what I thought about, how I responded to the world. She said it was a wonderful transformation. She loved the idea. Um, of course, I haven't gone through menopause, but I'll take Simone de Beauvoir's word for it because she's a brilliant woman. So we don't, we don't tend to think about this very much. And so culturally, like I said, our narrative is, I think, broken. And so I was thinking about some examples from other cultures. And, and one, uh, and I tend to, from the philosophical and literary classics, Lear being one example. Another one is uh, The Odyssey with Odysseus, an, a, just an amazing story. If you haven't read The Odyssey or haven't read it recently, I can highly recommend it. But what it is, is the story of a man and his wife. By the way, it is one of the rare stories from the ancient world that features a woman very strongly. And what they want to achieve in the entire book is what is theirs. The struggle is to achieve what they think is their relationship. They want to maintain it in their house, in their way. This is the struggle. It's a struggle internal to them with the external world. So at one point, Odysseus is a, a, 
offered immor- immortality, eternal youth, and he turns it down. He says, that's not mine. By a beautiful, immortal goddess, right? So she's the most beautiful possible woman, offers him eternal life. Actually, offers eternal youth. And he says, no. My wife is not as beautiful as you are. She may be at home cheating on me. This is always his fear. What has she been doing all these years I've been gone? And I'm getting older. It comes up again and again and again that he's aging in this story, that his, that his, his vitality is great, but ah, it's, it's, you know, where is he in this spectrum? And he says, no, I don't want eternal youth because that's not mine. And I don't want this beautiful goddess because that's not mine. What's mine is my wife, Penelope, who's aging like I am in my home because it's appropriate to me now. He's offered wealth and other opportunities for marriage. He turns him down. That is not me. That's not what it's, I, I, what I want is what's appropriate to me, akin to me, in my life today. And when he finally gets back to the island, he goes to see his father. And his father has been sort of uh, uh, struggling with the fact that his, his, his wife has died and his son is missing and presumed dead. And so he's moved out to the country and just started a garden. He's planted this beautiful garden. And Odysseus goes to see him there and say, you know, you know look, your, your son has returned. And the greatness of the moment, and it's a very moving moment because his father articulates roughly, now I feel order is returning. I, because this, it's not that I want to be young, I just want to see my children. I don't want to be eternally youthful. I don't want to take Viagra and have more kids. I want to be old. And I want to be me, but that means I want my son and my grandsons and my granddaughters around. So we don't have that narrative of being appropriate to what's ours and who we are as we change. Now, it would have been inappropriate for Odysseus to say, well, I'm just going to move out and start a garden. He gets offered this, by the way, because that's not where he is. That's not what he's supposed to be doing now. It's not who he is at this moment. And then when he meets his son, Telemachus, um, basically Odysseus says to him, all right, son, now you can't be this anymore. You're not a youth anymore. That time is past. What was appropriate to you before is not what's appropriate to you now. You're changing. Your position has changed. What you should be doing has changed. So essentially, let's kill a lot of people. (laughs) <laughs> this, is the, this is the outcome of this, but it's like, no, you're not. Now you have to act. You didn't have to act two years ago because that's not who you were. That's not where you were. You, now you've aged. Now you've changed. And, in, and so he visits every moment of life and is offered every possibility to be wealthy on earth, to be eternally youthful, to have the incredibly beautiful immortal goddess to be a ruler of men. And he turns them all down because he says, no, it's not what's appropriate to me now. And we, there's a Greek ethical concept called sophrosny. The pronunciation there is tricky. Um, but which one, we, we don't have a word for it in English, which lets you know we don't have this ethical concept at all. And it basically means sort of the me- middle way, but also it means the appropriate way. That, that part of ethics is knowing what is appropriate and right for you. And what is appropriate and right for you may not be appropriate and right for another person because they're in a different place. They're younger, they're older, they have more experience, they have less experience. And so judging what was right for you was this hugely significant ethical concept. For instance, if, if you were a particularly beautiful woman and you said, oh, I'm not so beautiful, that would be an ethical lapse. You were ethically obliged to say, no, I'm quite beautiful. Because it's true. And so that notion of trying to know the truth of who you are and where you are in the world at any moment, see, we abandon this. 
we just freeze ourselves at some magic age and then try to hold that forever. It's not going to work, but again, other cultures have not tried to do this so much. Uh, another example was from Epicurus and the Epicureans who, who were seeking a sense of sort of perpetual joy and harmony with the world. That seems like a good goal, I've decided. Um, that, that they thought that what we really want is to be uh, filled with a sense of thriving and flourishing. Now, of course, how you achieve that was uh, open to all kinds of debate. But much, if not most, of their focus was entirely upon how you thought about the world and how you thought about you in the world. And the first thing Epicurus says is, we need to banish the fear of death. As long as that mortality is out there threatening you, you won't move towards it with any grace, with any sense of joy. Back to the freezing, right? We freeze ourselves, I think, in part because we don't have that. Right? It, it's, uh, I mentioned this in, a, in another lecture a while ago. We always say people always say they don't want to outlive their money, right? which is just ridiculous. Outlive your money. Do it. Do it well. Uh, I, you know, it, it, it's a bizarre concept. Like I said, I want to outlive the concept of money. I want to live so long that people ask me, hey, old guy, what was that money stuff? What were you doing with that? I, said, I don't know. I don't even remember anymore, right? What a daft idea. But it's because we imagine that our lives and ourselves must stay the way we are now. Our world will stay the way it is now. And, and if, if it's going to be the way it is now and like it is now, then I need what I need now. And so I need money. So I don't want to be in a position where I don't have any. The, the corollary of this, of course, is what you're saying is I'd rather be dead than poor, um, which, is, which is, of course, not true because we would not rather be dead than poor. And this is, a, this is another concept that I think is important to bring up. This comes from Nietzsche. Uh, and he has this idea of the eternal recurrence. And he says, basically, if you take anybody at any time of their life and say, okay, we can kill you now, or you can go back and live your life again just as you've lived it before, with no changes, almost everybody would say, oh, I would rather just live my life again. <coughs> Essentially, we love being alive. We love aging. I mean, love it. We don't want to die. We don't want to cease. He says the great sin of man, Nietzsche, is not enjoying our lives enough. Right? Not, not loving the process as much as we really do. We pretend like we don't like it. Nietzsche says, no, think about it. We love it. We want to be alive. If we didn't, think what the suicide rate would be. It's not hard to commit suicide. Fatty foods, right? Cigarettes, we'd, be, we'd just be dropping dead everywhere. But we're not dropping dead everywhere. People in millions don't throw themselves off the top of buildings because even though we get depressed and even though we struggle with things, basically, we really, really love being alive. We love to age. At some level, though we might de deny it and fight it, I think we actually like the changes. Think how boring it would be to be the same forever. If we didn't change, you, you must have this thought, well, at least this is temporary. At least I'm going to outgrow this. At least this is going to go away of its own accord. Because even if I do nothing, I still change. Great Taoist concept. Uh, the, famously, they asked a, uh, this, this Taoist general, they said, well, I want you to kill this enemy. And the Taoist general said, okay, sure, I'll kill him for you. And so they waited a year, and they came in and said, he's still alive. And they said, yeah, I'm working on it. And they waited another year, and they said, he's still alive. And he's like, okay, yeah, don't worry, just, just hold on, you know. And like the fifth year, they said, well, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm waiting for him to die. <laughs> You don't have to work that hard, you just have to be patient. <laughs> right? Haven't you waited things out? Haven't you just really just stalled around for a year or so and said, well, this will pass, whatever it is, because things change. They always do. 
So while we live, it, it, we have this cultural narrative myth that says, oh, we want to freeze ourselves. Oh, we want to be eternally 30 or 25 or 33 or whatever it is. And the classic, by the way, uh, which I always like, the, 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 the 50 or 60-year-old uh, guy who's dating the 27-year-old girl, right, woman? I just love this. Because what it tells you is, it, it, by the way, this, is, this has happened throughout history. This is not new to, to the United States. But what it tells you is that in somewhere in the mind, the person has not changed in their own mind. Right? And I think we have this feeling at times. right? I don't feel like I've changed that much. It's completely delusional. <laughs> right? It is, which I, I'm okay with delusion, but, but it, is, it is completely delusional. You have changed immensely. And yet somehow we want to hang on to that version of ourselves. And so then when we look, we look back, we go, oh, I'm not 60 or 50 or 40. I'm sort of like the person really, truly inside who should be dating a 27-year-old, 30-year-old person, um, which is fine. Everybody's adults. But on the other side, I think, wow, to, to have imagined that you've frozen yourself for that long, is ter- that's the terrifying thing to me is that someone would see themselves as being essentially as they were. Again, this is wrong. All the evidence, you can do brain scan research, you can do endocrinology, you can uh, look at people's hormones, you can look at your body structure, experiences, language usage, the changes as you, as you age and have experiences. What a bizarre concept to think. But what I think we really do, by the way, is we imagine ourselves now returning and then how much more successful we would be, right? Because I always say, if I'm ready for the third grade, I am ready, I am going <laughs> to kick ass in the third grade. I can write the answer, dodgeball, I'm going to be killing some kids in dodgeball, right? I am ready. Uh, but, but notice this is not really what we should be thinking. I would be good in third grade because I've had some experience, I've grown, I've changed, I've matured. Uh, we, we shouldn't imagine going back in the past and re-experiencing with our minds now. But again, I would like to reverse think the other way. Now imagine you're in the third grade and you look out at the world and you knew everything that was coming. I think we would just go cry. We was like, what the hell? No way. What is coming? What, what the, the list of things that are coming? In my case, I always imagine that my parents uh, both died recently, by the way, speaking of mortality. Uh, you know, they raised, they, people let my parents have children. It's astounding. <laughs> it really is. And I thought they used to be responsible for me. If I was aware that these people were responsible for me, that would have been horrifying. But we're kids, we don't know. We embrace the change. We have no choice. Right? But so, so if you reverse that imagination and say, oh, if I was young looking this way, how would I feel? It's, it's an interesting experiment. But to try and break out of these cultural arcs that we write onto ourselves, that, that we want to be, again, basically we want to be eternally young. But Odysseus said no. Epicurus said no. Nietzsche said no. Many other cultures, Confucian culture, you do not want to be eternally young. You want to be, have some, some substance. You need to be older. You need to have some heft in the world. And the only way to achieve that is to grow in wisdom. And they associated growing in wisdom with growing in age. By the way, it's one of the curious things we've also done now is we've transferred wisdom to youth. As far as I can tell, this is the first time this has happened in the history of mankind. I mean, I take that seriously. I mean, quite literally, if you look at the research of, of all the great literary classics from the Epic of Gilgamesh, who is an idiot when the story starts, by the way. It's the whole point. If you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, the first literary epic that we still have from 4,000-ish years ago, he's a really, really young, bad, stupid king. And then he goes through an education. He gets a friend. The friend dies, and by the end of it, he's a very, very wise king. He becomes, Gilgamesh is not great because he was mighty and semi, you know, had a a, a godmother and, you know, all that. He's great because he came back with wisdom through experience. And somehow we decide you don't need to do that anymore, which is curious. Um, that, that we would suddenly say, you know what, no, that's, okay. that's all right. 
Experience doesn't teach you anything. Studying apparently doesn't teach you anything. We know this is wrong, and yet we've still decided to write onto youth all good things. It's become like money. Money is the ultimate good. If there's a problem, you need money to solve it. If money doesn't solve that problem, you need more money to solve it. Right? It just, we just we believe that. Youth is similar now. We've decided that all good things come from being young. Hence, freeze yourself there for as long as possible. Because we don't see any of the benefits. What do we gain? What do, what do we get when we get older? What are the benefits of aging? The benefits are change. That just inevitable process of changing and growing and altering and becoming a new person over time. One of my favorite examples of this is Georgia O'Keeffe, the absolute stunning, uh, just a truly stunning human, human being, by the way. I just think Georgia O'Keeffe is one of America's great treasures. Um, when she got uh, older, and she's living out in New Mexico, and her sight started to fail, and she started to go a little deaf, and this made her bitter. This pissed her off, sort of understandably, I guess. Particularly when you're a painter, and you're starting to lose your vision, and uh, a young gentleman, I can't remember his name, handsome young man, uh, took her out and said, well, let's do pottery because you can feel the forms viscerally that you can no longer see. And it was a total revelation to her. Just blew her mind. And she started to do this amazing pottery, just feeling the forms physically. Her, her nascent Georgia O'Keeffe power had not failed. What had been failing her was the notion that she wanted to be the same Georgia O'Keeffe she had always been. And then someone stepped up, I can't remember the gentleman's name, and just said, look, try this. And again, it was revelatory for her. because something new, something different, something she could do to express herself and feel the forms change. Um, and, and that sort of you know, power is always there because again, age means thrive. It means vitality. It means alive, not dead yet. Um, and so when we think about aging, try to, try to begin to write out, again, try to get this off and think change. Now, all, not, again, not all the changes are good. In, in no way am I uh, ascribing this. But think of the bad things you've lost. Hey, some new bad things are coming on, but what are the bad things I've gotten, gotten rid of? Right? Unfortunate husband dead. There you go. You know, I don't know. Uh, what are the, uh, you know, the, just what are the things that we have, have passed away? I mean, at some point you must have realized that usually it's about the 11th or 12th error for me. I finally go, you know, I'm not going to make that stupid mistake anymore. I hope. Uh, whatever the mistake is, right? And, and, and we go... But we lose track of that. We lose track that we're actually gaining. And we, because we want to be frozen, we tend to only look at what the, the changes that we think are detrimental. And so I'd really you know, try and think back through your own life and say, what have I lost? What have I gained? What's changing now? How am I different than I was? Where, where, where can that difference take me that someplace I might want to be or I might never have thought about being before? Um, and so, yeah, so, just, so the, the two things to take away, I guess, uh, in summary, is, is one, age, not dead yet, uh, and two, change is not bad, it just is. And we don't want to be frozen. We want to change all the time, because it's when we stop changing, then we're dead. So don't die. Be not dead yet. Thank you. <laughs>